Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Kyla Hannington with the Prince George's County Office of Human Rights, and it is my pleasure to join with the Prince George's County Memorial Library System in welcoming you tonight to the very first Finley and Chris Talk Truth event. Um, we're delighted to have uh, Finley and Chris back. They were here as our special guests uh, for our ADA anniversary event, and we welcome them back tonight with a uh, uh, L. Lamar Wilson, who I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit more about in just a moment. But I, I really just want to thank all of you for joining in uh, for this, the first in what's going to be a wonderful series. Your two hosts are Finley Holland, who is a young disability activist and writer. She was diagnosed with autism and a coexisting, and, excuse me, coexisting specific learning disabilities, dyscalculia and dysgraphia, when she was seven years old. A later than average talker, Finley was also functionally illiterate into the fifth grade when she found the world of books on CD and her avid reading career began. In the autumn of 2019, Finley developed severe joint pain and has been diagnosed with a connective tissue disorder. As a young person with multiple disabilities, Finley welcomes the opportunity to speak on her experience and to educate members of the public about living with disabilities. In 2021, Finley graduated high school with a 4.0 and is now a student at Towson University. And her co-host is even is Christopher Newhouse, who's an experienced special education instructor in DC public schools. He currently works at Ludlow Taylor Elementary in the H Street Northeast Corridor and is a proud Prince George's County resident. He has worked for B, um, excuse me, DC Public Schools for four years and previously held positions at KIPP DC and Bridges Public Charter School. He began his teaching career in DC as a special education capital teaching resident. And he is currently completing a post-master certificate in education leadership and administration at George Washington University and holds a master's in special education learning disabilities from American U University, as well as a bachelor of arts in psychology from Franklin and Marshall College. So as I said, we have a very special first guest tonight, and this is Lamar Wilson. L. Lamar Wilson is a multi-genre writer and filmmaker invested in documentary poetics, is the author of Sacrilegion, the 2012 selection for the Carolina Res, um, Wren Press Poetry Series, a 2013 independent publishers group bronze medalist, and a 2013 Tom Gunn Award finalist, and is the co-author of Prime, Poetry and Conversation. The Gospel Truth, a musical adaptation of Sacrilegion, Sacrilegion, was staged in 2014 and 2017, the latter time with a troupe that honors artists with cognitive and physical differences. The Changing Same, a collaboration with RADA Film Group that aired in, in PBS's 2019-2020 season of POV Shorts, was a special jury prize winner at the 2018 New Orleans Film Festival and named Best Documentary at the Sisters of the Diaspora Real Film Festival, an honor for RADA's Michelle Stevenson. Vinyl nominated the poem at the Film Center, Resurrection Sunday, for a Pushcart Prize. Wilson, a Florida A&M alumnus, has received fellowships from, among others, the Cave Conum, Ragdale, and Hurst and Wright Foundations. He holds an MFA from Virginia Tech and a doctorate in African American and multi-ethnic American poetics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Wilson's recent work centers the voices and experiences of black and brown folk thriving in the rural South despite relentless, centuries-long homegrown terrorism. After nearly 18 years of award-winning editing in several of the nation's top newsrooms, including the New York Times and the Washington Post, and appointments at Davidson College, the University of Alabama, and Wake Forest University, Wilson teaches creative writing, literature, and film studies at Florida State University and in the lower residency MFA program at Mississippi University for Women. So thank you to all three of you for being here. It's our absolute pleasure to welcome you today. Hi, thank you for having us. Um, to start off, um, Lamar, would you like to read some poems? Because I heard, know that you have some prepared. Thank you, gladly. Thanks so much. I'm so glad to be with both of you tonight. And thanks, Kyla, for the invitation. Um, I'm going to read uh, three poems, three short poems from my collection, Sacrilegion. Um, and um, it's a book that sort of takes you on a child to about 20 something adults' journey with discovery of um, an acceptance of uh, uh, physical difference, um, emotional difference, and um, what it's like to come of age in the midst of the AIDS epidemic. And so I'm gonna read some poems uh, that deal with that. 
The first is called Family Reunion 1993, and it has an epigraph from Lucille Clifton, my treasure poet, one of my favorite poets. Miss Lucille says, when I'm asked whose tears these are, I always blame the moon. I give my cousin my hand and think of the year before, how he'd held me aloft, his bicep pulsing against the weight of my bones and adoration. Can I get it by touching him? I wonder, but don't speak. Don't let go until his slick flesh kisses the commode, then trace curly cues and stars into my stucco canvas amid his grunts and sighs. Stare at the moon I've made there as full of itself as the one that had shown on us at the reunion. Our mothers in orbit around us in their own groove with Frankie Beverly. I'm flying, I had beamed at myself, gilded in his tooth, the only shimmering thing in this dark, damp silence. It could happen to anyone, a letter to the boy. The man in the shack on the corner wants to kiss you. He remembers when you jump roped better than most of the girls and prayed without manly pretense. Remembers how you remember the church mothers, knees and body bowed log, your genuine contrition for being broken and breakable still. You always was too pretty to be a boy. Come give me some sugar, he says, and reaches out to kiss you on your cheek. But his lips are thistles, his face a cavern of bones. It's World AIDS Day, and you are here to report his free fall from engineer to blind man leading the myope to fevers that flash on and off like a switch spooked by the God he still calls great and merciful with a smile. Your mother says his songs tore up church services all over town like hurricanes had done old U.S. road. Limbs splayed, stripped bare, convulsing like saints, like saints slain by spirits he conjured. You don't remember, so busy kneeling at the altar of this you the mothers and sanctified brothers could praise, who loved shirts against skins more than Bible study, loved tackling the most buff skin on the field, who always held you on top of him long enough for you to feel him hardening against you hardening. Give me some skin, he'd say and grin as you pulled away, then reached to pull him to his feet. This man doesn't know the you who dreamed of kissing the lead tuba player, but was too much of a punk or a saint or both to feel his leer from dais to bathroom stall. It could happen to anyone, he says, especially when you love somebody, make sure you write that down. You don't. Too sentimental, you think, for a hard news story. So you dig for the grit, for the who who branded him untouchable. He smiles, places one hand on his chest, gropes the table for yours. You using protection with these boys? His scaly palm grazes your keloid knuckles. I haven't, you know, yet you mumble. Happy for once to be numb. Glad you can't feel the heat. And the last poem I read, um, which discloses um, in the book, my condition that I live with, which is called Herb's Palsy. What did you do to yourself? It's also the question that people ask me strangely when they notice that I have a physical difference, which I'm sure we can talk about, which is always so strange, like the way that the blame is placed in these situations. What did you do to yourself finding fault? I was born and lived to darn myself a cocoon. I don't feel a thing in my left hand in here, but I used to feel everything everywhere else more than most. God said, let there be irony. And there was I, fighting the doctor's forceps on my coming out day. The preacher says, in all things give thanks, and I do. Thank you, God, for this holy bum hand. It's nice to be able to hurt myself and not have to take the blame. Yesterday, I burned my ring finger into a bloody mess. 
It's been burning for a studded companion for years, or at least I think it has. I can't be sure, but where I'm from, I couldn't marry who I want anyway. The preacher says this desire is unnatural. God don't make no mistakes and God don't like ugly. Thank you, God. I am an unnatural beauty. I felt this desire as long as I've not felt my pinky long before I broke it doing exercises the good doctor told me would help me feel again. The one that's still broken because no one noticed and I've learned it's easier to let you forget to sing. I wish some pervert had touched me when I was six or 17. Then I'd have someone else to share this blame. Every Sunday we sing, yes, Jesus loves me to the children and I cry. I stopped asking the preacher if his God loves me and my hand years ago. I intuited early. I couldn't trust his truths. Little Jay's eyes light up every time I walk into the sanctuary. Thank you, God. I am not a pervert. Thank you. Wow, thank you for sharing. I mean, the, your poetry is amazing, especially hearing you know, three very different types of poems and the, all the interconnectedness that they have as well is, um, you know, I love poetry and um, thank you for, for opening up and sharing those poems with us. I really do appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Um, one thing I noticed that you said in one of your poems, which I really liked is what you mentioned at the beginning, which is like the um, what did you do and what happened? Like, what did you do to yourself? Because I've definitely noticed as someone with physical disabilities, especially because for me, mine had a trigger and were progressed, like that people who knew me prior to my trigger felt like they would, that I did something wrong and would then were able to be like, well, what did you do? How did that happen? So I definitely related to that, especially to that part. Yeah, I think it gets, it, it speaks to, something about, I think it's a very American thing as well. Um, there's something in this nation, um, in the way that we see anything that is different as if it is something that had to have been self-created. There's this sort of um, burden of proof, a burden of, I, uh, I don't know, this abjection of, of um, I don't know. I, it's so troubling to me. Um, I can remember as a very, very small child, um, I was born with this condition. So it happened at birth, as I said in the poem. Um, and so it's not in the same way um, that you're speaking of your physical. I think you said there was a trigger um, for you, Finley. But like, I remember as a very small child, people asking me, how did you break your hand? Or what did you do yourself? We would be at the grocery store with my dad or my mom or marveling like um, when I would play uh, a sport, you know, like, um, you know, like, um, you know, how did, how did you break? It was always like, how did you break your hand? So there's the idea that something could have happened at birth that could have caused it was even like unfathomable. Um, and, and I think that's why it's so important for us to be open about the fact that we are different um, so that people can understand their difference. I think it's also out of a, a people's fear of somebody knowing something that is invisible or visible about them that makes them different. This idea of perfection that is so, I think it's so very much American. <laughs> I don't know. Having been around the world, I just see like this this obsession with perfect bodies and that we have in this nation. Yeah. And definitely one thing I think I know is I feel like sometimes that people who are able-bodied might and I don't even think they realize it, it's subconscious that they might not necessarily see their uh, disabled people, different people as like necessarily like an equal. Sometimes I feel like okay. I think it's very subconscious most because like, obviously I feel like these people, they don't see, like I had someone once cause I'm a child with disability, disabled. She took a step back, looked me up and down and then went how in a very accusatory voice. And she would never do that. I feel like you would never do that to someone you 
really respect or something like that. And I think it's something that as a disabled person, I find that sometimes I feel like I'm seen as like less than or in or yeah, in equal, which is why these people think it is appropriate for them to ask super invasive questions or ask them in ways that are very accusatory like by the taking a step back and asking how, or the, what did you do to yourself type sort of thing, mm-hmm. sort of ask this accusatory way that I don't think people would ask someone who they saw as like equivalent. It feels like being talked to as a child almost. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, I definitely- oh, Sorry, sorry. Oh, no, no, go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 go for it, go for it. No, I was just about to say as a teacher in, and teaching adolescents around the age of eight years old to 10 years old, there's often this, um, you know, I always wonder, you know, what's of my disabled students, what's their internal monologue going on at that moment in time when they get approached by a student that says, what happened to you? What's wrong with you? And I always, in those moments, you know, I always, partner with the teachers very close to me to aid in providing them more exposure through whatever means that is, through videos, through um, books, to ensure that we're having continued conversations around disability awareness and also looking at those questions and analyzing them with our kids saying, what could this, what could this incite in a student who is disabled? what kind of question do you think we could ask instead of saying what happened to you? Because there's this curiosity among kids too that I've seen, but as society, and especially in the United States, with this obsession of perfectionism, it breeds down into kids as well. And it's one of those very dangerous um, aspects that I've seen in schools, at least in this point in time where you know, I always just wonder, you know, I have some kids that come back feeling, you know, terrible about themselves because they will ask me, you know, I didn't mean to do this to myself. And I tell them, you did nothing wrong. That's something that is not your fault. You did nothing wrong. So never let anyone tell you that you did something wrong. Uh, that notion of blame is so, is so important to remember. Absolutely. Totally, totally. I think also as a black person, multiracial black person, there was a real pressure I felt to be perfect because there was already like, you have so many things that are gonna be up against you. So I was kind of raised to sublimate, um, you know, my physical difference and to not make it an issue for, to like to make everybody else comfortable, to overcompensate. And um, it was really a shock when I started to write these poems in my late twenties, early thirties and share them with my family to know that I was carrying all this stuff because I never talked about it. It was a sort of silence. So it's a beautiful thing, Finley, that you have such support um, and, and that you learn to be an advocate for yourself um, at a very young age. I'd love to hear you talk more about that journey since we are, you know, I'm starting my journey in these poems as a very young child and how writing and language acquisition I just, I'm so fascinated by how audiobooks. I'm just, I'm just so fascinated and, and so inspired by your story. And so I, I want to learn more about how you um, learn to advocate for yourself for a time that you remember when you were very young, the classroom, maybe even like Christopher's talking about where you had to advocate for yourself and you found yourself having a real success. Yeah. So for me, I was diagnosed in grade two with um, autism dysgraphia and dyscalculia. And part of that, at least, I don't know if that's the same because I grew up in Canada. So I'm not sure if this is the same in America, but in Canada, like once a day-ish, I I was in the typical classroom. And once a day, me and another student who had autism were like taken out for an hour or so. And we were given just like special classes, but the courses were very much based on like learning how to read body language and learning how to understand basic kind of like communicative skills that um, I, that weren't into the typical level. Um, And, but everything else I did, read reading and math was still with the general class. And I became, I never really knew that I didn't know how to read. I just knew I wasn't as good as anyone else. Um, but in reality, I was just really good at lying. 
Um, it's a skill I or like really good at pretending, you know, like I use those like body language skills and use them for the drawings and was able to put together most of this stuff to kind of elude people enough to get by. And then in grade five, essentially my, I had to do a book report. So, and I was given Harry Potter. So my mom went to the library and took me out the Harry Potter books on CD and was like, you can do your book report with the CDs. You just also have to read the book along with it. So that's kind of how I started. And like, I kind of fell in love with that. And that's kind of how the journey of reading was introduced. Um, and then when we moved to America, I started, I became, because of the move and other outside factors, I did develop depression and a huge anxiety disorder. So I started to become very dependent on reading as a way of coping. And that really did build that skill and being interested in reading. And um, for the, so that's kind of how I got into reading and I started using that as a way of like escapism. And with the self-advocating, I think partly because of I was in Canadian education system. When I came here, they put in the American education system, they put me in the lowest level of courses because of my disabilities. And I was like, that's great. This is too easy for me. Um, can I be moved up? And this was like, and so then they moved me up to this one, which was highest, which is two teachers in a course. And I was like, this is still good. This is still too easy. Can I be moved up? And they put me in the normal classes. And I was like, this is cool. Can I go into honors now? And they said, no. Um, they pretty much said, because of your disabilities, you cannot move into honors. And so for all of middle school, I pretty much every, I was like, can I go into honors? Like I have hundreds and 10% literally because of extra credits. And I also have anxiety and depression because of just the environment of the classroom was very toxic to me. And it was like, I do need to be moved up. And I, when I was able to get into high school, I was put in the regular classes and I just pretty much immediately just went in and was like, I need to be moved up into honors. And that was able to happen to me. I was able to get moved into honors for high school, which was great. And that was in the right place for me, but it was very hard with the like, and I trying to get into it. And I also think part of the reason why that was hard is if you look at my transcript from Canada, it was really low. Like it was in like the equivalent of like D's and C's because I couldn't read. And because I learned how to read just before moving, if you look at the evidence, it would look like I didn't need to be in those courses. But whilst in reality, I did. And I think because of my disabilities, I wasn't moved up. So that's kind of my long story. No, thank you for sharing. There's somehow I intuited that knowing what about the move from Kent, I just, I intuited that you would, I, without you telling me, I knew that you would have to advocate because I, I had friends who were gifted and, and had, especially young men of color who had what we would now probably call ADHD. I'm old enough before it was a thing, you know, like I'm older, they were just, we were hyperactive kids. I, you know, so they were kids who were hyperactive who because of that and because teachers didn't know how to deal with that energy, they put them in these you know, remedial classes who were like brilliant, smart young men who were tracked in a certain kind of way um, uh, because they, they didn't have the proper diagnosis of, you know, and they weren't, and there was, and they didn't have parents necessarily who knew how to advocate for them. And they didn't have wonderful teachers like Christopher <laughs> who, were, who were in the school system, you know, to advocate for them. So I just intuited that in this US system, it's just starting, I think, to really because of people in in the roles that Chris Chris has and people that I knew in high school. There was one teacher who really advocated for her her students, who became a dear mentor and friend of mine. It's just so it's just so important to have teachers who will listen and understand that just because students have something that is different, just because a student has a different disability, they should not be, you know, put in these lower classes. Um, but but I saw the trajectory of that over the you know 13 years of, of my education in the in the 80s and 90s in Florida um, where I, where I was was mostly educated. Yeah, yeah. as someone with a language based learning disability, I have that, and I've grown up to learn to how to you know compensate for my differences with that with my disability. I was told very long ago that I was not able to learn a foreign language. 
And that was one of the things that, you know, when I got to high school for a long time, I believed that. And, you know, those type of messages that, you know, I certainly got those at a very young age that said, you know, you have a language based deficit, so you can't learn a language. And in middle school, I believed it. And I was like, very ashamed of feeling as though all my friends were learning a foreign language, but I couldn't. And when I got to high school, I started to break out of that saying, you know what, I'm going to jump in and learn Spanish. That's something I'm going to really hone in on and really want to do. And if it wasn't for my um, sophomore year uh, Spanish teacher, I don't think I would have learned Spanish. And it was one of those things that she knew my backstory of, you know, not of being excluded from language classes due to my disability. Uh, but I let her know, you know, I was like, I'm really, I really love different cultures. I really love to learn a new language. And um, I'm, now I'm fluent in Spanish. So it's one of those things that, you know, I think the many of the battles I've had growing up in education, especially in special education in terms of messages that come down that have a very defeatist type of, of tone saying, you have this disability, so you can't do X, Y, and Z. You know, that's something I also face today as a professional in special education, where we have this mentality that's being, um, you know, I, I think our understanding of disability is starting to improve in certain areas. There's more research, for example, on um, learning more about autism and more research learning more about dyslexia. We, there's so many initiatives related to those um, disability categories, but there's still this notion of, you know, as a self-contained teacher, teaching students with intellectual disabilities, oh, they have an intellectual disability, they probably will never read. And I was like, no, they need, they learn differently. And I, and responsible for finding that different modality for them and they can read you know it's it's a matter of um you know breaking down those stigmas which are very ever present in in the u.s education system I, you know friendly you talked about the canadian system and you know w was that present there as well you think yeah, so um, just real quick to answer a question in the chat is I moved to America in, when I just before grade seven. So I was 12 years old and I've been here since. And so what I know is I was for me personally is I found that in the school system, I didn't really ex in Canada, I didn't really experience too many necessarily what I would call huge issues and i think part of that is i was someone who i didn't need to be in a self-contained class i was able to mostly be fine um i wouldn't say it was perfect but mostly be fine um in a class where just a couple times a week i would be taken out for a few hours i think and then uh, there was a teacher in the class with us miss wilson who worked with me and like the two other people who had cognitive disabilities in the course and for, for me, that worked well in Canada, um, but I also well, didn't need to be in a contained class there. And I didn't know that was a concept until I moved to America and I was put into one of those courses. And for me, it just wasn't the best course for me. But so that's kind of one thing I've noticed with the differences is just the I found that in America, it feels much more isolated for me. I've noticed that it's been, it's more separated in like the self-contained classes, which aren't in the school system in Canada coming here. And that pretty much being the only option they, I felt like they wanted me to take, like they wouldn't move me up to honors beca because I, they didn't think I could do it in America. So that's one difference I've noticed, but to ask a question on this just a little bit, because I know that we have all worked with, um, we've all worked with IEPs and having stuff like that. And I've just noticed, I'm just curious if anyone, if you guys have any opinions about able bodied people working in IEPs, because I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. But I've also noticed when I was in school, 
because like the everyone who worked on IEP was able body and at my university, I know that at least the majority of the people working in the accessibility and disability services, ADS are able bodies. I do notice things like that where I'm feeling like I'm almost a burden for asking my, for getting my need, trying to get my needs met. So I'm just curious if you guys have like, no, have any similar experiences or your opinions on that. I, I have a confession. I am in my forties and I have for the first time in my life sought accommodations. So I went through the entirety of my education all the way through my PhD without asking for accommodations. Now, in the midst of my taking my exams, an able-bodied person who was my advisor at the time without my consent or knowledge went to my department chair and asked her to give me extra time on my exams. I, my, so I live with a condition called Herb's palsy, which means um, the brachial plexus was uh, damaged at birth. And so I don't use my left hand in any way. Um, but I never, I, I was raised to, to hide it, to function like everyone else. I learned to type with one hand. I, ta I taught myself, I would take, I, I went in into took extra time so that I could type faster than everyone else. So a lot of my issues that I have lived with, including the depressive disorder and everything, I internalized. I think it has a lot to do with being a, a black person in America because it's just like you can't you can't have something else to add, you know. And so I was a straight A student. I graduated at the top of my high school class. I was I was a valedictorian in my class. I, I was a perfectionist, graduated with a 392 in undergrad, you know, I was at the top of my master's. I was always, I had this perfectionism and I never asked for accommodations. And then uh, I went through this really bad fall on my job um, in Alabama and had a really, a really bad injury. Um, and, uh, and I had sort of in my normal way of doing things, I rushed myself back to work before I was ready because I didn't want to ask for accommodations. And, um, and I have had to learn over these last three years as I've readjusted and moved from different jobs. So for the first time in my life, I'm going through this very process of asking for accommodations, like in the real in real time, um, as it relates to my physical difference that I've lived with for 40 something years. And as it relates to the cognitive things that I have that are, that are newer for me. Um, and so I don't have the experience with IEP, um, but, we are at my institution, uh, a disability activist with whom I work, the cyborg, uh, Jillian Visa, who is a tenure professor. Um, I'm a, a assistant professor on the tenure track. Um, have been We've been talking about uh, really the fact that we need disability, uh, disabled people um, in that, in those positions mm -hmm. to advocate for disabled people who have the cultural competency and the sensitivity to know how to not ask these inappropriate questions like what you know what did you do to yourself and all these kinds of things you'd be surprised as i've gone through this process the ways in which i've been sort of um having to deal with the unsettling um like uh, sort of that the thing hovering in the room well why are you asking now you know like that kind like you're 40 something years like why now like that's kind of a subtle undercurrent um that i'm experiencing that, that, that people aren't necessarily saying, but it feels like it's hovering in the room. And I don't think that kind of air would be there where, where somebody who was not able-bodied, you know, or, or, or who is somebody who has some kind of disability themselves. So I, I agree that it's something that that is an issue, um, that people who are disabled are not necessarily always empowered in these positions to advocate for um, those who are coming, you know, with IEPs or other needs of accommodations. So that's what I can share in my my experience. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing, Lamar. That's, you know, as you were talking, I was almost reflecting on my own upbringing in terms of having an IEP and going through K through 12 school with one, having a, um, a learning disability and also um, being diagnosed with mild cerebral palsy. Um, so growing up, you know, I would have related services related to having occupational therapy and physical therapy, but it it was to a point where I got to um, 
you know, middle school around fifth or sixth grade and realized I was like, I don't really know if any of my teachers understand the difficulties I'm encountering or if they fully are aware of how hard this is for me or, you know, trying to, you know, take an arduous reading and test when I have a language based reading disability or, um, you know, anything that involves um, having use of, you know, figurative language and anything like that, like poetry, for example, was something that um, was really difficult for me. And I think that, you know, I had some teachers, you know, that would um, be empathetic and are more so sympathetic in terms of saying, you know, that must be hard for you, but not make the extra effort to show me a different way. Or, you know, I would have other teachers on the other side of things say, you know, you don't need that accommodation. You don't need it. And I would sit there saying, you know, you know, that when I had that teacher, that's when I realized I'm like, I've got to be an advocate for myself and advocate for, yes, I actually have a time and a half on a federally bound document that is on your desk. <laughs> so, and, you know, I think that he, when I realized I finally had my first special ed teacher in high school who also had a learning disability growing up where I could truly connect with them and I could truly um, understand, you know, some of where I could see myself in the future. I could see myself in that person. Um, and I had them as a teacher for about three years as my special ed teacher. And I, in that experience in itself was really motivating for me to get into special education, knowing that you know, there was a huge deficit of, um, you know, people within special education who are working in that role as a person who is disabled. And, you know, as being disabled myself in my role today, you know, I really think that, you know, I've worked with other colleagues who are able-bodied and who are special educators. And, you know, we're always talking through like, you know, if they're proposing a service for a student and how they're incorporating the student's needs in that service or how are they are engaging with that student in a meaningful way, not just proposing something because, you know, we're just going to propose it. You know, we have to ensure that we're being mindful that the student is aware of that service and what it is and also, um, you know, involving the family in a heavy way to ensure that that's appropriate for that student. I think that, um, there's such a need and there's there's a huge issue of just having a critical shortage of teachers in general, especially in special education, but it's so powerful to have a special education teacher who is disabled, who can connect with their students in a way that an able-bodied person um, could not connect in the same way. Um, yeah. yeah. My roommate has a quote that I, she does know that I am going to say, um, which is pretty much she is entitled to a good education without requesting accommodation specifically. Because one thing we've talked about, which is she feels like when she does act, try and get accommodations that she can sometimes feel like a burden or like she feels like the people are like either the school, if when she presents her IEP or when she asks for the IEP, that they are seeing her as a burden, like the kind of like, when you hand them the paper, they might sigh or something like that. And it's, I think well, part of the reason that happens is because there's in education, on education, but also so many able-bodied people being part of this. And there's nothing wrong with someone who's able-bodied working in disability services, but it's the fact when it's the majority or all, where it can become this reluctance or this stress or anxiety of asking for accommodations where that can occur. And I definitely, and like, cause I remember once with my school at my university at the very beginning of the school year, I was at, I was living, I was at school for four days. School hasn't started yet. There was an acquired event for all of them, um, freshmen, but it was in the arena on campus, which is not accessible. Um, cause there are stairs and I couldn't get into it. And I filled out the form several days earlier saying, I need the accommodation. So I'm going to need the access to the elevator. I'm going to need a chair. I'm going to need this. And I didn't have those accommodations. And I went to my disability, my ADS case manager and said, I want to complain. 
her, the first thing she said was, well, let's not use the word complain. And I kind of responded. I was like, no, let's use the word complain. And then I got really defensive because I was, because then you kind of get that gaslighting that in your head. So I got really defensive because she didn't want to necessarily use the word complain. And I think probably a, I'm confident a huge reason that happened is an, not enough education, even though she works in the disability department, not there not being a disability representative in the school, though that is being worked to being changed, and there not being enough disabled people working in the disabled, um, the disability services. Yeah, I think that's amazing that you are such a advocate for yourself, the both of you are. I see a question from Billy Best here. Do you all want to address that in the chat? Yeah. yeah, so when it comes, just for me, um, I think that there should be mandatory disability training for everyone, and I believe that there should be more funding towards that. And I think that that's something that there there needs to be more money towards because like in my high school there was one elevator that you needed a key to get in and you needed to request a key and the elevator took like a minute and it was very long and you only have five minutes to get across class so i think that it is important that there is more funding towards tr disability training people at every person um who works at a facility especially a school to learn more about disability and how to manage that and also the school itself or the building itself becoming accessible. Well, I, and I think that in the wake of COVID where there's been such an uptick in, you know, so many different depressive disorders, and like there's so, there's so many people living with, you know, COVID's impact as far as grief and, and physical, there's so many manifestations of disability and difference that are a part of our culture that just as we're in this post me too moment learning about sexual harassment and having those conversations that that disability conversations and training should just be a default because we are forever changed by what has occurred over the last two years and for if for no other reason than that to normalize it and not make it because it does i it does it creates unfortunately the way the system feels for me going through the first time it creates the this sense of a burden of proof that one deserves, you know, what is, what should be, especially if you have a document, you know, as you all have had your life, like, yes, I deserve, this has been determined. This is my right. This is my human, this is the right that you can't take away from me. I, I just think it's so unconscionable to, to, to me what happened to you, Finley, and I'm so proud of you for, for advocating for yourself, but. I think yes, that my answer is yes. There should definitely be um, required disability training that is as, uh, just like we learn the honor code at our universities or whatever that else that should that should accompany all, the, all of that training that we get and any kind of orientation. I think it would, it would shift the, the whole energy of, of a student's experience, um, especially a disabled student's. But also, it would I would hide, I think heighten people's able-bodied people's sensitivity to knowing how um, to interact with with, with students mm -hmm. who are disabled. That would be groundbreaking. I think that with this heightened awareness around the disability spectrum, and as well as recognizing the variety of disabilities that are present in humans, I think that with heightened awareness, there's such an eagerness for people to engage in a, in a training or engage in an awareness, um, you know, session where they can learn more about how to be more supportive, how to be more empathetic. And, um, you know, at my school, I actually ran a committee called Creative Minds a few years ago where we did disability awareness months and we, um, as a school would do like disability awareness walks and learn about that month about a specific disability, whether that be Down syndrome, uh, dyslexia. Um, and that would go as far as teaching students about that disability through literature and videos and very meaningful steps for kids to learn more about a specific disability, but also for staff 
to learn more about. Um, for example, with dyslexia, I ran a series um, within the school to um, learn more about what dyslexia is, what are the components of dyslexia, and then that led to conversations about dysgraphia and dyscalculia, and I realized, wow, like everyone really is kind of, is very eager for this information. They're very um, hungry for it, but the capacity that the system provides for disability awareness and disability um, training is, you know, I can already tell that at various moments in the year, I'm like, is this a priority of our district? Is this priority of our federal education system? And that's something that I've always reflected on. And that's why I continue to do the work that I do and advocate as hard as I do, because it matters. And disability is part of the human condition. Um, it's not something that you can run away from. You know, disability is, is across spectrums, across genders, across race. And we have to recognize that um, the more that we educate each other, the more humane it will be to each other. Um, yeah. And I think that's definitely one thing, which is people don't want to be rude. And like people don't want to be mean. That's something I've always, I definitely know, like after I was able to make my complaints and talk to the person who was in charge with that event, when I told her what happened, she was devastated. And she like apologized so many times. And she was like, wanted to make it better like she did not mean to be hurtful and when there has been times where people have said something that was been ableist and i've told them like i've called them out they always feel really awful they feel bad and i think that's one thing which is people don't want to be rude people don't want to be mean and i think that's part of the reason why it's so important to have trainings to have um forums like this or events where people can talk and ask questions or just listen to learn like okay a lot of disabled people maybe don't like when people use the word handicap like i know i do not like that word at all and i know a lot of other people who do but a lot of able-bodied people don't know that so it's if by going to events people will know that and then maybe start to use that word less or things such as that mm -hmm. there's another question um See. mark mark Hen Pennington says, I've been in the education business for 40 years. My impression is that things have improved, but still have a long way to go. Do you have any sense that things are improving in academia or not? I think that might, if you would like to answer that, I want to be too, because I, I have not I mean, been. I would say, I would say I'm hopeful because I increasingly see students like you and, and colleagues like myself coming out as it were and saying, I am different, I am disabled, this is what I need. And as more of us require of our workplaces and our education systems, what we need, they show up as you just said. And, and, and because I think in general, human beings, as Christopher said, want to be kind to one another that we are, that I, I, even with everything that we see on the news and that we see on the internet, I tend to believe that the, the, the majority of people are loving and want to be kind and want to, you know, make it better for, for their, their fellow person. Um, and so in that way, yes, I, I, I have that, you know, Martin Luther King perspective, like the arc of justice is bending to, you know, the arc is bending toward justice. I want to believe in that. Um, and that has been my experience. All these years, I didn't ask for anything. And as soon as I began to say, I need help, or I'm not okay, or this is, you know, I need a standing desk because, you know, whatever. Um, and I, you know, uh, people, have, people have been accommodating. Um, the, 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 it gets back to something else that I think that we talked about earlier is, is that sort of, and I think this gets at the second question that I saw from Anja, which is, you know, how does the US education system's culture of competition create these environments for disabled students or late blooming learners? How can we fix the competition culture? I think these two questions are hand in hand because 
-hmm. this perfectionism that you spoke about earlier, Christopher, that's being bred in the culture passes down to everyone, including people who are disabled to sort of like hide, you know, their disability. And so those two things are bumping against each other constantly. But the more visible that we people like us are, I think the more the more there will be those who will say, I need accommodations, I need, um, I'm not okay, you know, I need some help. And and the more people will speak up, the more the systems will will improve. What do you think? You know, I remain hopeful. I remain as hopeful as you, Lamar. I think that there's, you know, among the colleagues I work with at my school, there's such a, um, you know, I always have an opportunity to collaborate with a teacher in a general education environment that are very much willing to include our class and bring them into the classroom and ensure that, um, that at least that, you know, I teach in a self-contained setting so that at least that our class has that in inclusive opportunity that they're, that they have the right to. Um, but I also have teachers reaching out to me saying, you know, my students said they have X, Y disability, what, you know, and I have their IEP here. I'm trying to make these, you know, activities for them or would this be appropriate? And I think that growing up, I, I'm unsure if my teachers, you know, in elementary school, middle, or even middle school or high school were collaborating on that level. I'm sure that there was some mandatory collaboration that teachers were engaging in, but the fact that, um, you know, that the, that teachers are having the opportunity to, you know, reach out to me on their own accord without having like an IEP meeting set or anything like that. Um, to come and ask a genuine question on how to support their student um, who's been open with them about their disability as well as, um, you know, open lines of communication with the family. And I think also that there is a greater awareness around self-love of disability. I think that, you know, even my master's program, there was this heightened awareness of person first language, which I know that in recent years, very much until now, you know, throughout um, this time of pandemic as well, you know, I've learned that that can be very harmful. And I think that, you know, ensuring that we are listening to, um, you know, our disabled peers and how they want to be referred to and how they want their disability to be referred to is super important. Um, and I found that, you know, even, you know, my parents in my classrooms, um, you know, there used to be this stigma around using autistic, for example, and saying, oh, like the person who has autism. And, and I would always say, you know, we don't have to make autistic a bad word. You know, there's not some, we don't need to lace that with, oh, we should feel shame about that word. That's a bad thing. I was like, no, disability is part of the human experience. So saying autistic, means that we're making that an ingrained part, you know, it's part of them. And we can't just say, it's not a part of them, it's the person who <laughs> kind of making that separation. Um, but with that movement reminded me of how hopeful I am to say, wow, people, there's such great advocates right now, um, advocating for how they wanna be referred to and how they, you know, such as you, Finley, and, I think that um, with heightened awareness and continued advocacy, which appears to be occurring, um, I think that we're heading in the right direction. It can feel slow. It really can feel debilitating at times. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think I actually have a sticker on my water bottle that has like a bunch of phrases people use, like challenged, handicapped, handy capable, differently abled, diverse abled, and special needs, and they're all crossed out. And underneath it says just disabled. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason for that is I saw a beautiful comic once of saying, I'm not a person with autism, I am autistic. And then comparing it to saying, I am a person with a water bottle. Mm -hmm. I am not a water bottle, right? Like, cause I'm not like, it's not like that sort of yes. thing. By saying that is it describes as something I'm just like, I'm holding. Like, I'm not like holding the autism. I am the right. autism. I am autistic. And it's kind of like a that sort of thing where it's like, it's, and there are people who prefer 
who might prefer the word challenged or might prefer the word um, person with disability. And that's completely fine and that's valid and I love and support them. But it's also very much of it's you really much have to talk to each person because it is different, but also understanding that just be there are certain words that some people might find very offensive. So it's always, but other people might be okay with that word. So it's always coming on very gently. And there's also nothing wrong with just asking someone. How do you like, yeah. yeah. Can no. I address you as disabled or a person with a disability or different or challenged or what would you like to be called? And and people evolve over time. I remember there was a period of time that I was calling myself differently abled. I had a real personal aversion to the word disabled because I said as a child, I was a culture to not call myself that and that that stigma was going to, you know, get me put in those other classes. And I wanted to be able to be in the honors classes, all the things that you just said that you went through. And so I am, again, at this point in my midlife, just starting to own with pride the, the, the word disabled. In fact, I was featured in some magazine because I was hired at FSU with, with the colleague that I mentioned previously. And I posted the story on LinkedIn and one of my undergraduate classmates um, from Florida a &M wrote as a question, disabled question mark underneath the article about me. And I responded with this long response. Yes, actually, these are all of my disabilities. And then she deleted her comment, like, you know, so that my, so that my long response was deleted. But um, but it was I mean, there are people who didn't know until I was a senior in high school, they pretended not to have ever known that I had this disability, you know? So it's just because, so yeah, I think that it, it, people do evolve. And I think as we normalize that this is, that there's not something wrong, that there's, there's not something to be ashamed of, that this is a part of human experience, which I think is the most beautiful thing I've ever, you know, it's just, that should be on, I want that on a t-shirt. Disability is a part of the human experience. I want that. <laughs> Uh, such a beautiful thing. Oh, oh gosh, that went by so fast. I know oh. my my yeah. face is some bad news. <laughs> but I I have yeah. to say I love I love that idea for a shirt. I think we should make them. Yes, it's just absolutely wonderful. Very sure. Wonderful. <laughs> and so yes, yeah, so those of you watching my face appearing on screen is the bad news, and it is the news that we have um we've come to the end. But I know Lamar, you had a poem that you were hoping to close us out with, right? Just a a yes. Short little poem. Yeah. Yes. So um, this has a phrase um, that is abhorrent um, from a, a, a Jamaican song um, by a man named Buja Bantam, but hopefully it's resolved by the end of the poem. Um, this is called What of a Body. What of a body that cannot lie, of sinews that do not obey when commanded to cease their quaking? What of a body that scoffs at holy water's conditions, of pores that hunger for a tongue's fetter, of nerves deaf to homilies, of sweet by and by, and bati boy, boom, bye bye. Who can hold this body in his hands? Silence its tender muted moan beneath scars that will not heal. That's it. Thank you. I, I, it's just been such a pleasure having you here. Um, and it's an honor for all of us that you took your time to be with us tonight. For people watching at home, one of the best ways, absolute best ways that you can support uh, Dr. Wilson and, and all the wonderful artists and writers that we, that we bring to you is by buying their books. And so you can get uh, Lamar's poetry collection from your favorite independent bookstore. You can get it out from the library. If you need help finding it, you can reach out to me. Uh, the library system here will make sure that we can uh, help you get a copy of his works. Um, and you can also visit lamarwilson.com to learn more about Lamar and his incredible, incredible work, which you've had a a, a wonderful introduction to here, but it's too short of an introduction. Um, Finley and Chris, thank you so much for doing this series. It's just a delight. And this was an absolutely amazing first, um, first show. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. And so for those of you watching, please join us. We have a bunch more wonderful events coming up. Please visit pgcmls.info slash events to see what the library has coming. And you can also visit the Office of Human Rights page at tinyurl.com slash, nope, wait, I already got it wrong. 
I already got it wrong. Just visit the library, pgcmlash.info slash events, because we do a lot of cross events. Again, thank you, everybody, for being here. It's been just a fantastic discussion, and I'm really looking forward to the next one. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.